And the only other characters, the only other main characters to mention are the uh, Bubba Hendershot's um, assistant, this guy named Joey, played by Patrick Miller. Mm. Um, not much else to say about him other than he's fat and he's funny. He's fat, dumpy, poop man. And uh, we get this scene of uh, Billy talking to Joey while Joey's on the toilet. And every time Joey gets nervous, we hear one just slip out. Oh, it's really good sound. It's really nasty. Oh, man. She really got a lot of I just, uh, I think that, I watched that and I think, really, Stephen King, yeah. this is what you decide to write after everything you've done? Hey, if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. I suppose. Yeah. And that moment when Billy steps up and leans in and yeah. looks at him, I just think, I bet Curtis was, wishes he was here. <laughs> yeah. Yup. Oh, man. So much bathroom in this movie. And this character's not pretty big, but he is throughout the film, and he's one of the few people to survive all the way. Handy, played by Frankie Faison. Is that the waitress's boyfriend? No, he's the um, driver of the Green Goblin truck. Oh, yeah. The black guy. Yeah, he doesn't, they end up kind of like not giving him any more lines, really. Well, he does help out Billy near the end. Yeah. And he does survive all the way. Yeah. The black guy lives in a horror film. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. But yeah, Frankie Faison, um, he doesn't do much here, but he's a fun character actor, and he's been in... He's been in a lot of stuff. He's one of those character actors who is always a bit part or a supporting part, and he's, like, in Silence of the Lambs, it, all of its sequels. Showtime. Um, he was on an episode of Oz once. Really? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, he's been around a while. He was also in Stephen King's The Langoliers miniseries. And that one, he does die. Oh, that's too bad. That's all the main players. There are a few other characters, but most of everybody in the truck stop is... We don't really hear their names, and the ones who do, whose names we do hear, I can't identify them. Yeah. Yeah, we just get a bunch of dumb southerner characters, or nice southerner characters. Yeah. This movie takes place in North Carolina, which is a little odd for Stephen King. It's a good fit, though. For the, for the story. Yeah. Stephen King himself has a cameo in the movie. Pretty early at the beginning. He's, um, that guy at the ATM. Oh, that's him. Yeah. Yeah, no shit. He goes up to the ATM, and... And there's a scene at the truck stop where we see their arcade room with uh, pinball games, Atari arcade games, and all the games are on the uh, on and playing on their own. And the quarter machine is shooting quarters out. And you know this is old when there's a cigarette machine dispensing cigarette packs. I would have loved to have been alive when those were around. Hmm. Probably wouldn't have had to have, uh, no one would have to wait till they were of legal age to buy them. Yeah, true, actually. Now that I think about it. Actually, it makes me wonder, what is a cigarette dispenser machine doing in a game room? 
where most likely kids are going to be playing. Well, that guy that runs the truck stop would definitely like to make some money off kids smoking. I suppose so. And there's this guy in the arcade room who's not really freaking out by everything. and He's having a great time. Yeah, and he says to one machine, Yo mama. <laughs> We see he stuffs like a tw like a Twinkie, I think, in his hat. He just takes everything he can find, and I was just thinking, how is he expecting to walk out of there without anybody noticing? Yeah. And the only weird moment I would say with him is when he just takes a paper cup that doesn't seem to have anything in it. Yeah, it's just like a crappy paper cup. <laughs> I don't get it. I think it's just like a little joke. Maybe he's got a compulsion he just has to take. Yeah, maybe. And then we get this odd moment where he just stares at the at this arcade game called Star Crystal and he just it looks like he's being hypnotized by it. Yeah. Just staring into it like wow. I thought there was gonna be like a message or something, but I'm bringing this guy up is the guy who plays that um, arcade player is Giancarlo Esposito. That sounds familiar. You ever watch Breaking Bad? Yeah. You know the character Gus? That's him? That's him. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, this was like his second movie role. That's nuts. Yeah, the guy in the arcade who gets uh, fried with a bunch of cigarettes stuffed in his shirt. That's Gus from Breaking Bad. That's crazy. Yeah. I would never have guessed that. So young, man. Jeez Louise. And this cameo is not really that important. It's not even a cameo. Like At the beginning of the film, we get this scene where a drawbridge is going up. And this was a pretty cool sequence. It was a little funny, but actually pretty effective, I think. Yeah. Like, it plays out realistically how cars would fall over if a drawbridge went up with them on it. Yeah. And uh, I like that moment where the cars are f sliding down and falling down, then all of a sudden a watermelon from a, from a grocery truck smashes through a car's upper window. Yeah. I thought that was actually a pretty cool moment, pretty uh, scary. Like, I just think, imagine being in that situation. For sure. And they kind of use the watermelon to make it look like a bloodbath. Yeah. But like, you know, it's just like the watermelon juice everywhere. And we get this bitchin' shot where this giant uh, truck on top of the drawbridge is stuck between the two pieces as it's splitting. And then when they're far enough apart, the truck just slips down. We get this awesome slow motion shot of it just going down. This There are just so many car crashes and explosions in this film. There are so many fucking explosions here, I lost count. Michael Bay lost count, dude. <laughs>
And the reason I brought up the bridge scene is there are a bunch of couples in their cars, and we actually get a van that has ACDC painted on it. Yeah, that was cool. There's this woman, billed as second woman in the end credits, who is played by Marla Maples. For anyone who doesn't know, care to explain who that is? Drump's second play toy? <laughs> or first? Yep, second. <laughs> Marla Maples is the second wife of Donald Trump for anyone who's been living under a rock. And the fact that she's credited as second woman is just makes this all the more funny. Yeah. Because yeah. She, she actually was the second woman. That's funny. I didn't notice that before. So, overall, Maximum Overdrive is... It's pretty stupid, but it's a lot of fun, and its pros are definitely all the stunts, the explosions, Emilio Estevez, Laura Harrington, and most of the cast do pretty reasonably good jobs, even though a, a couple like Pat Hingle, um, um, Ellen Mick, the woman who played Wanda June, uh, even though they, their characters are made unbelievably fucking stupid, um, they still did the best with what they were given, I think. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of actors where the performance is bad, but when you think about it, as well as the type of director they had, can you really blame them? Like, Michael Bay, he gets a lot of great actors in his movies, and look what he does with them. <laughs> Same goes for M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Mark Wahlberg, The Happening. What? No. And some of the film's coolest sequences um, that we haven't already talked about, um, care to tell them about the steamroller scene at the baseball field? Oh, I love the steamroller scene. The little kid falls off his bike and gets his foot caught on it and a steamroller just comes flying on the baseball field and crunches him. We even see his head like bounce off. Here he comes. You're gonna love this scene. It's ballsy though, like just killing a kid right on camera. People don't usually do that. Yeah, I mean, John Carpenter. His second movie has a little girl getting shot in the chest with a silenced gun. What movie is that? That would be... Assault on Precinct 13. No kidding. Then it shows it? Yeah, in wow. full graphic detail. Man, that's, that's a badass. I was just thinking last night about how little you see kids get killed in movies. And not only do they kill kids in this film, they kill a dog. Yeah, that's gross. Yeah, like, we see a dog that apparently got choked to death by a toy car. Yeah. That apparently ran on batteries. Nasty. Yeah. But uh, I got a cool fact about that steamroller scene. Yeah. Originally, the steamroller was supposed to get smeared with blood. So, like, the more it ran across the field, the grass got stained with blood. That'd be awesome. However, there was an accident when they filmed. Um, when the steamroller ran over the child-sized dummy they were using, the blood packets in the, in the, in the dummy went off way too early and they really exploded so on camera it made it look like the kid's head blew up as the steamroller ran over it <laughs> stephen king loved the effect <laughs> but the pussy ass bitch faggot censors had them cut it out ah oh, that sucks that would have been awesome boo boo more kid heads blown up <laughs> And there actually were quite a few accidents, 
none of them quite as fun as um, this, that one. Yeah. You see, uh, that scene with the killer lawnmower chasing the kid? Mm hmm vehicles like the trucks like you they did a pretty good job of making sure we never saw anyone driving these trucks I was wondering how they pulled that off and I think I read that most of the trucks were remote controlled and that lawnmower we saw was also remote controlled and there however there were a lot of accidents because trying to remote control a fucking rig is hard enough yeah but when they were filming that lawnmower scene, the lawnmower went out of control. And it actually was a functioning lawnmower. Just had like a remote control device in it. And it went off set and hit a block of wood, causing splinters to shoot out of its um, exit hole. The director of photography got hit and he lost an eye. Jesus. Yeah. That's gross. You'd think they'd take the fucking blade out, you know? He uh, sued Stephen King for $18 million. Did he win? It was settled out of court. So, yes. And also, another accident that almost didn't, but almost caused another casualty. That scene with the... Um, there's a killer ice cream truck in this movie. At the end, um, Curtis and Brett uh, shoot it down and it just flips over. And you notice how the truck, when it uh, flipped over, it just came right at the camera. Yeah. When they filmed that, and I'm guessing they cut this out in editing, the truck actually slammed into the camera. Really? Yeah, it got, you can see it got really close, but then it cut away. And I read that it almost, the truck almost uh, crushed the cameraman. Jeez Louise. And the dolly grip, Gene Poole, uh, pulled the guy out of the way at the last second. Jeez. Yeah. King, it's, it, you kill enough people in your books. Yeah, you don't gotta do it in real life. Let the real people uh, live. And this is a cool fact. The Dixie Boy truck stop, it was not real. It was uh, the whole thing, the gas pumps, the building. I was thinking that. It looked so cheap when they were destroying it. I was thinking it looked like they made it for the movie. It was all set. Yeah. But it does, before they uh, destroyed it, it looked very convincing. For sure, yeah. It was so convincing, in fact, that actual truckers would stop at it. And they had to put up a sign um, about a mile down the road to let anybody coming in that it was not real. That it was just for the movie. <laughs> That's crazy. I guess you could say the set design was pretty on game here. For sure, actually. I think it looks really good. And uh, just because I think he deserves some props, the director of photography did a very impressive job considering he lost an eye on this film. Yeah, I actually think the visuals are like one of the, probably the best part of this movie. I think it's a cool looking movie. The shot of the truck circling around and stuff. Cool. I like this shot a lot with when it's nighttime and uh, Deke is crawling towards the sewer and you can see the like green sky in the background. I think that's a wicked cool shot. Yeah. The green sky uh, looked interesting. Very 80s, I it think. Super 80s. And, uh... One part that I thought, uh was a fun bit of cheese. Like, I think it was stupid, but fun. 
was the exposition we got at the beginning, at the end, in the text. Fucking hilarious. Like, it, one of Stephen King's faults, I guess you could say, is that he has a habit of explaining everything. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't apparently believe in uh, keeping it a mystery, or late letting your imagination work. Yeah. And like, yeah, he tells us everything that's... He solves the mystery in the first ten seconds of the movie, and by the time, you know, like, the Brett character's like, I think it's the comet, we're like, yeah, we know. Yeah, <laughs> we knew at the beginning. the end it's said that a Russian weather satellite <laughs> shot down a UFO with a laser can. And I'm like, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? I don't get it. Yeah. This is, uh, this is fun if it's true. Stephen King originally wanted Bruce Springsteen for the lead. Really? No kidding. That'd be crazy. Yeah. The worst, uh, scene... Maybe we were born to run from killer fucking trucks. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta know. What was your least favorite scene in this film? Like, what do you think was the worst scene, if you had to choose? Mm. That's tough. I think that the last confrontation with the Green Goblin truck was a little lackluster, but I, I really like the way it ends, though, when Emilio says, Adios, motherfucker, and blows it up. But I wish that they kind of had more of, like, a moment, you know? I think it, look, it looked cool when it went up in flames. It looked awesome. The red eyes, yeah. the fire in the mouth. I just wish, I think there could have been like a little more tension in the like last, you know, getaway scene. Yeah. But I think by that point the movie had kind of like given up on being scary. It felt like it was, uh, the last few minutes feel like they're thinking, let's wrap this up, come on, For come real, on. Yeah, that's what it feels like, like, get on the boat, woo! <laughs> My least favorite scene, aside from... We made you is when they had that montage of refueling the trucks. Oh yeah. There were a few funny moments like when they like when, especially when Curtis looks like a grease monkey. Yeah. But for me this sequence was so dumb I could actually feel brain cells falling out of my ear. <laughs> I'm with the cowboy guy. Just let them uh, burn and their fuel out. And at the end, Emilio's all burned out, going, "Oh!" And yeah. he, he, he's been, he's acting. Like, he's in so much pain. Like, he, he's almost acting like he just got back from battle. Yeah. And I'm thinking... just, like, putting fucking... It's fueling up trucks. Yeah, that's all he's doing. I mean, the acting's good, but it doesn't match what we just saw. Yeah. If this had been... This scene belongs in a war movie. Not a film about killer trucks. Yeah. Emilio Estevez, man, he is a he is really a good actor, and I think 
I think it's a shame that he didn't stick around longer. I mean, I, don't, I think the last uh, really big thing he did, I could be wrong, but I think the last really big movie he did uh, was the was one of the Mighty Ducks sequels. No oh, shit, has it really been that long? He's done a few others, but I can't think of anything else. Yeah, now they mention it. What happened to him? I don't know, and I remember at the roast of Charlie Sheen, they go, how is it that Emilio is the one who stayed clean and he's the one out of work? Yeah, I think Emilio is a much better actor than Charlie. I do like Charlie Sheen, but I think Emilio's better. Yeah. Although, we gotta be fair, neither of them are, anything, are anything compared to their dad. For sure. Their dad is a whole nother thing all on his own. Yeah, he's fucking great. And, just because I like to give credit, the movie was uh, edited by Evan A. Lotman. And I'd say the editing in this film was pretty crisp. And the cinematography done by the, uh, sadly, uh, hurt, Armand, Ar Armado Nenuzi killer. And the movie was produced by Martha De Laurentiis, Dino De Laurentiis, who uh, released such films as Dune, Blue Velvet, and Manhunter. No oh, shit. He's also um, responsible for um, the Silence of the Lambs sequels, like Hannibal and Red Dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it was released by his um, production company, DEG, De Laurentiis Entertainment Group. Hmm. Yeah, Dino, he was one of the biggest movie producers of the 80s. And um, he lived, I think, the age of 90 or 95. And he was producing um, up until the last uh, three or four years of his life. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty badass. Yeah, and um, I can't think of many other movies that DEG made. Um, I think they uh, took part in Evil Dead 2. Mm. And uh, this movie called Trick or Treat, about a bullied heavy metal fan who finds a um, satanic record that when played backwards summons the soul of his um, dead rock and roll idol. <laughs> it's another horror comedy. Yeah. And it appears to be um, kind of similar as far as the uneven tone as Maximum Overdrive. The film features Gene Simmons in a cameo as a radio DJ and Ozzy Osbourne as a anti-rock and roll televangelist. That's funny. That's awesome. Yeah, he's wearing a suit, his hair's short. Can he talk? Yeah, he's completely coherent. Wow. Those rockers really have a strange sense of humor, don't they? I don't even think it's a sense of humor. I think they're just out and out sick people. I mean, and they're trying to make everyone else around them uh, who, who listens to their music as sick as they are. Gonna drive my long steel missile down on your love channel. Deep, deep, you'll beg for more. Raising hell and serpent score. Feel me, feel me. Now, what does that mean to you? To me, it means nothing but a sexual act. So I think this is our review of Maximum Overdrive. I can't think of anything else I could really say other than it's dumb but fun and I definitely recommend checking it out. You'll either love it, you'll hate it, or you'll laugh along the way. Yeah. It's a fun time and if you're big on 80s movies, 80s horror, 80s horror comedy, I think um, it'll quell your needs. Everything about this movie is excessively 80s. Tubular. Tubular. On a scale of 1 to 10, what would you rate this movie? Hmm. Give it like a 6.5. I'd give it a 5.5. Yeah. Like, it's fun, but uh, still, um, a little, it's still a little too stupid to really make sense of. Yeah. However, there is a possible explanation for why this film is so all over the place. Really? Stephen King has admitted that he was 
coked out of his mind while filming this movie. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. The 1980s. Maybe that's how the guy ended up losing an eye. Uh, <laughs> oh. That's dark. Whoa. Yeah. Stephen King was, uh, not only is he a recovering alcoholic, but in the 1980s, he had a very serious cocaine addiction. And he says he was doing it all throughout the shoot of Maximum Overdrive, and he really had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> Stephen. Okay, if you don't want Kubrick to make your shit, at least get David Cronenberg. Oh, yeah, that'd be dope. Or Brian De Palma. Yeah, that, that, yeah. They yeah. made, they made those movies. Carrie, De Palma, mm -hmm. Dead Zone, Cronenberg. No oh, shit. Yeah. I didn't know Cronenberg made a Stephen King. Is yes, he did? It's awesome. Oh. Christopher Walken is the lead. Oh, man. How have I not heard of that? Um... You're a millennial. Mm. I know I am, but uh, I'm different. <laughs> but yeah, he says he would like to direct again someday now that he's sober. I think he's been sober since the uh, late 80s. The only time he's had any exposure to any of the drugs, I think, was after his near-fatal car crash in 1999. Hmm. Like, they had to hook him to a morphine drip, because he was so beat up. Jeez. I don't know what Stephen King directing again would be like, but uh, hopefully better than this. <laughs> and uh, I'll end this with one more quote from the man himself. When asked, why haven't you directed since Maximum Overdrive, his answer is, just watch Maximum Overdrive. Thanks for coming back, Matt. Hey, thanks for inviting me. This was fun. Yeah. See you next time. We made you! <laughs> <laughs>